Afternoon, guys. Hey. Hey. Recognize a few faces in here. Good to see you again. <laughs> All right. So I'm gonna. I've got the luxury and the uh, the pleasure and the pain of trying to explain a very complicated protocol that works under the engine in less than 30 minutes. Okay, so to try and make this easier, I find that since we're all engineers, it's best to try and describe an engine by looking at an engine. All right. So you might have noticed this big graphic sitting up here to the right. All right. What this is about is anybody here watching the Olympics right now? All right. right now. Trying not to. Well, not right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right now, I hope you're watching me. But have you been watching the Olympics over the last few days? All right. We're the official supplier of the entire network infrastructure that supports the entire Olympics. So every single time you see a score registered, you're watching the Olympics, you see an athlete on their iPhone or Android device, every bit of that is streaming over our fabric. Okay? So what I'm going to use, I'm going to use that as a use case to describe what we're doing in the industry as a whole and a lot of what Randy just talked about. So a lot of this is going to be kind of interesting. So how many of you guys have a background in MPLS? Perfect. That's awesome. Okay. I'm going to twist some of your minds a little bit. Okay, because I'm going to tell you we're going to be able to deploy a VRF, IP multicast, IP unicast, LAN extension. You normally think of VPLS and a single protocol. All right, anywhere, any moment. The entire Winter Olympics, there's only one protocol running the entire infrastructure, Shores Path Bridging, based on Fabric Connect, right from Avaya. All right, all the routing, whether it's unicast or multicast, all the VRFs providing that activity, all being provided just in Fabric Connect based on SPB. All right, so what I want to be really clear on this, because there's oftentimes a, a, a view of whether or not the IEEE, when we're working on this protocol, right, and I am a co-author of the protocol. I've worked on many protocols in the past, as well in the ITF, as well as the IEEE. I've got a lot of patents in MPLS, as well as ISIS. And there's a lot of experience built into this protocol over years and years of knowledge of everything we did in X25, to ATM, to Ethernet being the new Metro E, to MPLS now being deployed around the world. Basically, we're seeing enterprises all over the world basically wanting simpler ways to deploy services. So as we looked at how we we're going to deploy enterprises, we're looking for simpler ways to deploy it, a plug and play model. It just works. Okay. Now, to be clear, it's not simply just a carrier protocol. It's not a metro protocol. It's not a data center protocol. It's not a campus protocol. It's an Ethernet protocol. And by making Ethernet better, we've made IP better. All right. It's a symbiotic relationship that exists between IP and Ethernet that's really powerful. All right? You can get boxes from everywhere, any vendor in industry, plug it in together, and they just work at Ethernet. All right? The IP just works as the device is connected to it. It's incredibly powerful. So as we look at that, what we did when we looked at Fabric Connect was the integration of our knowledge of both layer two, three, and virtualization all together in one. One viewpoint seeing everything at once. And to that point, what I describe here at the Olympics is not specialized just for the Olympics. We have deployments that look identical to this in stock exchanges, hospitals, ma airports, manufacturing floors, casinos, all over the world. All right? So don't think this is specialized just to there. I, see, I know networks are going to deploy that only have about three switches running SPB. There are several deployed that have several thousand switches. All right? In fact, this one has nearly 2,000 switches and 2,500 access points. All right? All right. So let's dig in a little bit. Why are we using SPB? and the Fabric Connect technology to run the backbone. So Randy talked about the simplicity concept, and we said simple a few times. What we mean by that is that in the traditional world of, say, you want to do a LAN extension, if you ever configured span entry across multiple ports, it's a pain in the butt. We all know that. Having to configure a VLAN to a port, span entry group, hop by hop across the network. In this world, you simply just go to one port on one end of the network, and you configure an ICID. This new ICID, by the way, stands for Engineal Individual Service ID. And what it is, is it's defined in 802.1H. Think of it as the new VLAN model. But VLAN's becoming like a VPN. But instead of 4,000, <coughs> we have 16 million available to us. And then all I have to do is configure, saying ICID 7 here maps to VLAN 20 coming in. I walk all the way to the other side of the network, and I say ICID 7 maps to VLAN 400. I now have a LAN extended across the network in milliseconds. There's no more configuring span entry, <coughs> no more hop by hop configuration. All right. So that's 802.1 AQ. It's also RFC 6329. Joint standardization we went through both the ITF and the IEEE. <coughs> All right. Now, what else are we doing in this? Well, SPB is based on ISIS. What is ISIS well known for? One of the most scalable IP, IGPs on the planet. We still have all that routing information available to us. 
So you notice these little router icons sitting here on the edge. This is actually routing intelligence. In fact, when you notice this icon flipped on its end, these are VRFs. So we have the ability to actually reuse the ISID as a v VRF ID. That means that we deploy these VRFs without the need of BGP. There's no route targets. There's no route distinguishers. The same model in which you configured the LAN extension from end to end, I just go over here and say VRF blue ISID 22. VRF blue ISID 22. The VRF is done. It's up and running. And we're actually going to show you a demo of this live. All right? When Ed gets up and talks, he's going to walk through why this is important and how we actually configure it. So you'll see a live configuration on CLI. Because I know most of us are CLI jockeys in the room, right? <laughs> we like to see, see the proof, right? All right. So the one thing I want to point out here, notice you don't see any of these router icons in the middle except for one, this gray icon. All right? That's what we call a GRTA, a global routing table. It's what existed before there were VRFs. Now, what we're talking about there is really important. We have this concept we call stealth networks. And they existed for a long time that most people didn't know that they were there. If you think about a lot of environments who are doing video surveillance or, say, credit card processing or medical records, in all those environments, they're buying multiple physical networks. They buy one network for video surveillance. They buy another network for corporate IT. Maybe another physical network <coughs> to run the credit card processing. Because they had to guarantee re the regulatory compliance that that information was secure and locked away. All right? Now, in this environment, we're doing the same thing. We have completely locked down networks. So I'll get into talking about this thing we call the games network, the clocks. The clocks in that environment, for example, are one of those locked environments. Now, IP multicast is all different. This entire environment allows that to, to provide IP multicast awareness routing at the edge. And you'll also notice there's no rendezvous points. There's no bootstrap routers. So when we first wrote the protocol, SPV, we spent a lot of time working on the multicast algorithm, a shortest path first Dijkstra-based algorithm that not only has unicast <coughs> intelligence, but also multicast intelligence, so that we can handle what we call bum traffic, broadcast, unknown, and multicast and Ethernet. We take that algorithm, and guess what? It makes a phenomenal algorithm for IP multicast routing. So you get to the point in IPTV deployments where someone can sit there with remote control hitting channel up, and each channel up is an IGMP join, and it's instantaneous delivery of the video feed right to them. All right? We also get some pretty cool things. We can summarize multicast because I can take 100 multicast streams and summarize them to one address in the core. The other thing to notice about this is there's no routing table here. There's no need for a routing table here because this is not your granddaddy's Ethernet. There's no flooding. There's no reverse learning. Every single FIB entry in this environment has been completely controlled and locked in by ISIS. A shortest path algorithm basically ran seeing where everybody is in that environment and locked in the FIB state about where it needs to go. We prevent loops before they can happen. So instead of using a TTL to say, well, when a loop happens, this is how, I'm gonna, how big I want the crater to be. Now this says no loops are allowed to happen, right? because we won't put the fib state on any port for everywhere else. Okay? Because what this allows is that you have much smaller fibs actually sitting here. We don't end up with an OSPF uh, fib, an LDP fib copying the routing table to another label database. BGB running and route and reflectors in here, or if you're Randy, you're statistic and you're doing confederations, right? But that's a whole nother discussion. All right. That makes sense so far? All right. <coughs> Ride with me to the next, the next level. Let's talk about the environment. This is actually an amazing large network going on in the environment. There's two clusters going on in the Olympics. There's the mountain cluster and the coastal cluster, separate about 40 kilometers, right? And every single village you see there, from where the luge is, the slalom's being done, right, to the ice skating rink, the hockey rink, all of that are what we call venues, right? We have venues that are actually where athletic events are happening. <coughs> there are venues where the, uh, the non-athletic events, like the dorms and things like that, where the athletes are staying, right? And all this connectivity is provided by one fabric, one protocol. You notice we're talking about the data centers. I'll get into this, and we're actually going to get to network design. Right? The tech op center, where we're sitting there, there's two of them sitting there. So if one disappears, the whole network keeps running. We're fine with that. Two media centers so that the, all the cameras filming the events are streaming back, and that's <coughs> being encoded into an IP multicast stream, being fed back down in. Another first for the Olympics. Now let's look at it from a different perspective. Who are we supporting? Now, I know you guys might be watching Twitter about what's going on over there, about some people having issues. We're supporting what we call the Olympic family. So when you get off the plane and you're on your cellular, that's not our network. If you're an athlete, part of the Olympic Committee, a volunteer, a referee, some kind of scorekeeper, right? you're given an actual Active Directory login. And we know exactly who you are. Now, to be, step back for a second here, 
Think about all the people. You've got thousands of official <coughs> scorekeepers. You've got 80 teams with over 5,000 athletes coming in, 25,000 volunteers, and thousands of reporters. Right? We had a vendor out there that was so nice that they decided they're going to donate 8,000 Samsung Galaxy Notes to every athlete. That's, that was very, very gracious. We step back and go, wow, that's 8,000 new devices suddenly appearing on the network. Right? <laughs> so we're looking at this. Now, that's another important point. We went from zero to 40,000 users in one day. <coughs> it's the world's largest BYOD network. <laughs> right? We have about 40,000 people, and we're planning for roughly around three devices per person. That's 120,000 devices. It's the first Olympics where they're offering Wi-Fi free to, these, to the Olympic family. Anywhere they go. And you know what everyone's doing. They're tweeting, they're Facebooking, they're on YouTube, they're taking video, uploading. No don't downtime. This is one of those environments where we have to be up nonstop. And any outage in the environment has to be invisible. Now to give you an example of how invisible we can be, we're deployed in a lot of hospitals around the world. Right? Two of them I'll give you a story from, was rather funny. Um, one hospital decided to move the SPB off OSPF. They're not running any of your apps, they're just simply running it. They went from 10 seconds of convergence time to 50 milliseconds network wide. The whole network reconverged in less than 50 milliseconds. <coughs> when one of the core links from their service provider went down. Right? Even more interesting study, uh, story excuse me, was uh, just about a month ago, one of our customers told us they got a phone call from their service provider apologizing because one of the core links went down. He's like, what are you talking about? He's like, well, your core link between these two cities just went down. And he goes back and looks at it and goes, oh, yeah, it's down. The fabric had converged so fast that not a single doctor, nurse, storage, or email was ever affected. The whole network had reconverged you know, that fast. So in this environment, we've actually tested, we're getting in 20 milliseconds of downtime when you kill switches, right? Core switches. The reason why we can do that is we've got one protocol running everything. It's got visibility, so we're not fighting between state machines and, and protocols, between converging different protocols at different time. One protocol sees it all and it dikes to runs, and we got visibility again. Right? None of the services are affected. And what's cool is you, if you look at the graphs that they sent us from that hospital, there was no packet loss when that link went down. Okay, <coughs> so what are we looking at here? So let's focus on the left side of this thing for a second. This backbone you see over here to the right is a 54 terabit backbone. Right? It's got every switch we make, from the closet switch to the core switches, the aggregation switch, the topper rack switch, um, all interconnected, running the fabric as an end. It's also running our management server. So what we have in this environment is something we call identity engines. It's like an SDN controller that's watching all the edge and watching all these users on their device. Okay? And I'll get into that a little deeper in a second. Now, also, there's 2,000 switches, combination from about 50,000 ports and 2,500 access points. <coughs> Connectivity is everywhere. You can go to a bathroom and still have full four bars on your, on your Wi-Fi. Right? It's really important to have that kind of connectivity. But the, la the <coughs> third to last bull here is 36 HC channels is another first for the Olympics. And what this is, is essentially is we're taking 1,500 set-top boxes across the entire infrastructure, and they're getting live feeds from every other event. So no matter where you go in the Olympic Village, you're watching live TV of what's going on at every other event. <coughs> so we're streaming these 36 AC channels. That's all IP multicast. And again, no rendezvous points, no bootstrap routers. It's all the power of PIM with none of the complexity or baggage. We just turn it on at the edge and immediately it starts seeing all the sources and receivers and connecting together in milliseconds. <coughs> and the odd thing is, is that the more receivers and centers we have, the faster it converges. Right? All right, so that thing, we have, of course, IP phones in there. We also have, uh, we have a lot of developers in Innovaya writing applications for iPads and Apple and Android because most of UC is now moving to handheld devices. That's why we call unified communication. So mobility in this environment is really, really key as we look at this. So now let's get into the fun part, the network <coughs> diagram. Okay? Just soak this in for a moment because there's a lot of information. All right. So left and right, what we got is two data centers, a primary and secondary. There's actually a few more data centers going in the background. They're called dev data centers and a few other things we're doing. All right. Then in the middle, we got the admin data center. The admin data center is where basically we're hosting all the applications that manage people manage things. And then we have the actual IPTV head end. This is the media centers too, coming out. All right, so as you look across this thing, you notice a whole lot of colors. And off there to the left, you notice the colors associated to different VRFs. Internally, we call these VSNs, virtual service networks. You can either have a layer three virtual service network, VRF, or a layer two virtual service network, LAN extension. And we look at these things as being cohesively together. <coughs> right? For example, you can have one VRF with 15 layer twos attached into it. You can have another VRF with one million LANs attached into it. 
Why would you want to do that? For example, you have a VRF sitting up here at the head ends of the data center, and you've got layer two VSN stretched between these two data centers, so that V motions and Hyper-V motions and whatever you like to move your VM on happens completely transparently under the IP layer. Because what we've done basically by doing this integrated view of layer two and layer three is instead of looking at the world where I've got yeah. layer two access coming in from one edge in the data center, connecting to an IP core, layer two access coming in another edge, connected to an IP core, and V motions are stopped because of the IP endpoint, right? <coughs> but if I lift the IP layer up off the Ethernet layer, anywhere I have an Ethernet port, I can stretch a LAN anywhere at any moment within milliseconds by one point configuration. That means in this environment, when I move a VM from this data center to this data center, it thinks it's going in port one and out port two of one switch. It has no idea how many switches it's actually going through or that it's going under an IP layer. And all the routing is all self-optimized between that. Everything is a source path from the perspective of any endpoint to any other endpoint. And you'll notice that we also look at this, the top racks here as they're directly connected to each other. It's because we look at this thing we call a distributed top of rack. <coughs> if you think about the flows of a data center, we talked about this back in New York, right? If I want to have the connectivity between this, I have the lowest lightning path view from any top of rack to any top of rack to do any communication call. And I keep it self-contained in any given VRF. So I have true multi-tenancy in this as well. Down at, at the actual venues themselves, you notice the actual TV screens up there. That's where the set-top boxes are coming in. So what happens is at any venue, there's a camera coming in, an IPTV feed, goes into its own VRF, comes out the IPTV head and gets converted to an IP multicast stream. So if you're watching TV and you're watching the Olympics, this is where it's coming from. We take that same feed and we feed it on a VRF down to the set-top boxes. And you can sit there, channel changing, and it's IGMP joins every single time you do. Flipping through HD channel instantaneously coming up at you. Now, we're not configuring rendezvous points. The routing decision was done right in the VRF. All right, now the turn on multicast routing in a VRF is multicast enable inside the VRF command. All right, it's really, really simple and really easy <coughs> to do. Okay, now this is the easy part of multicast, that is. That's because it's one sender and many, many receivers. But remember, SP was designed for the bum traffic Ethernet. It was designed for the concept where everyone's a sender and everyone's a receiver. <coughs> So the algorithm is designed to do incredibly fast multicast calculations. That's why when we get to Darren, we talk about video surveillance. That's the worst case scenario. Because that is, everyone's an IP multicast center of these cameras, and there's only one or two receivers. Now moving across this, you'll see the access points across the top. Notice that the colors associate to different VRFs. There's not a single human being managing any of the access switches. There's actually a policy server off the side, an SDN management model, where as soon as <coughs> all these VSNs exist, as soon as an athlete shows up, he's put in an athlete VSN, isolated into his VRF automatically, no matter where he goes. Right? Someone tries to unplug a clock, any kind of you know, scoring device, the configuration for that port disappears. The minute they plug the clock back in, the configuration of the port to the VRF automatically reappears. Completely locked down and secure, and that's what we call stealth networking. It's really important <coughs> when we're talking about doing credit card processing, PCI, HIPAA kind of environments. We have many networks deployed out there right now who are PCI DSS compliant because of this functionality. All right. So as we're moving through this thing, you notice we have these identity engines and the wires. <coughs> this identity engine is what's doing that out there to the end, managing all these access points. All right. When we have the internet feed, we're providing the internet connectivity for everyone in the Olympic family, no matter where they are in that village. And they're coming across that VRF and locked out and hopping out. There's three things I like <coughs> to talk about when I talk about why you would want to look at the fabric. We call them, and there's the three pillars. We go fast, flexible, and secure. The speed of deploying your services, incredibly fast to reconverge. The flexibility means that you can deploy a service in any moment, at any time. At Interop, when we did the Interop network, for example, on the fly, we were extending LANs and VRFs everywhere in that environment while the show was going on without a single disruption to service. <coughs> right? We sent three people to do the entire network. If you look at the Wall Street Journal, they sent 30, other vendors sent 30 the years before. Right? Now, even beyond that, and looking at this kind of connectivity, this, the security aspect is really important. There's no routing tables up here again because we're making <coughs> a routing decision only at the edge. We route at the edge and we switch to the core. The switching is controlled the same way that MPLS would lock down the switching infrastructure. So we're not flooding up there. The secure aspect as well is that any single person <coughs> in this environment who tries to ping or trace route, no matter where they are to anywhere else, sees a single hop. 
the network infrastructure is completely invisible to every user, whether they're trying to come <coughs> from a VM, wireless device, or anywhere else. Whole thing looks like a single hop. Right. It's a level of security that IT guys have been dreaming about for years because no longer they have to worry about hackability of the core, right? It's invisible to them. <coughs> but you notice when I was talking before, I had this little gray icon in there. That's the management network. That's another stealth network for us. We want the management interfaces things to be a stealth network, the same level of security as the PCI compliance. <coughs> so that we make sure that there's no way anybody can get in to see it. Now there's some tools we're going to show you in CLI in a little bit, how we spent a lot of time looking at this. And I come from an operations background. I used to run some pretty large networks, right? When we look at the deploying of networks, you got to think about the fact it's really the complexity of managing and troubleshooting when something breaks. That's really the problem you got to think about when you're deploying things. Giving you functionality without the tools to troubleshoot it would be a waste of time. So we w did a lot of work inside of uh, CLI and even in tools so that when you want to go from, say, um, one edge to the data center, the path from the top to the data center itself is congruent. That means the path from the top to here and then back is going to be exactly the same. It's predictable. But it's also load balance. We have these things we call BVIDs. Now, I want to be really clear on this. This does not mean you have to rip out your infrastructure. Many of the deployments we put SPV <coughs> in was a migration. SPV will run alongside OSPF. It's just IP and Ethernet. It's just VLANs. So everything you know about IP and Ethernet still applies. You just get to do more with it <coughs> than you ever did before. So we're seeing environments that were holding off from doing IPTV to the hospital bed now are able <coughs> to do it. Digital signage, multicast, they just plug it in and go. They don't think about it anymore. They don't worry about the complexity of who can troubleshoot PIM here, and am I the one who's going to get the troubleshooting call on uh, Saturday night when I'm on a date with my wife? <coughs> right? So the CLI tools we do, for example, we have this thing in ISIS we call system name. Anybody here familiar with ISIS? Right? It's kind of iffy. Here's a cool thing about this. If you know OSPF, you already know more than half of what you need to know to run SPV. <coughs> We've simplified the configuration so much that it's every, most things are automated. That system name thing I talked about, think of that like DNS for a routing protocol. It's been built in for <coughs> like three decades now into ISIS. We used to use it in MCI. And what it is, is actually when you, the, the router is announcing its link state <coughs> advertisement, in ISIS we call it link state PDU. It actually says, okay, this is my router ID, and then ISIS, we call it system ID. <coughs> Guess what? Six bytes, hexadecimal, and it's unique. Does that sound familiar? It's a MAC address. All right? Right underneath it <coughs> is something we call system name. That's actually the CLI prompt from the box. So if you're naming your boxes, like San Diego, Biz Brisbane, or Mickey Mouse, or Donald Duck, that's the name you get in there. And what does that translate to? When you do a show adjacency, you see San Francisco, Brisbane, yeah, Mickey Mouse, Donald <coughs> Duck. Okay, when you look at the routing table, you're going to see the routes that are being announced. So if I go to a routing table here and do a show IP route or show VRF route, I not only see the routes I'm seeing, I also see the next hop as the node that's announcing it by the actual ASCII character name. So your troubleshooting time can drop dramatically when you're looking at that from that perspective. Now additionally, <coughs> one thing that Randy mentioned was this thing we call uh, ADS. Now, Built into the switches we have this is we want a feedback loop between these things as performance metrics. <coughs> We're actually able to test the latency and jitter loss across this network because we've embedded agents not only in our switches but also in the phones that Avaya makes. So that should kind of give you a clue why does Avaya care about networking. We care greatly about networking because most of the deployments of UC and CC when we start to see failures is because there's a problem in the network. So not only being able to give you better ways of doing networking, we also want to give you better ways to troubleshoot the networking. Because <coughs> oftentimes, as in any network environment, what happens when something breaks? There's a lot of finger pointing. Right? No, it's a carrier. No, 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 it's the enterprise. You misconfigured something. No, it's the IT guy. No, it's the voice guy. This allows troubleshooting real fast. There's a latency issue on switch one. There's a latency in the core from the service provider. There's a QoS setting that's not being properly marked. And it actually is doing it predictively so it tells you exactly <coughs> where the problem happens. It allows us to troubleshoot both the application layer and the infrastructure layer in tools in two different steps. It's a really nice, nice visual thing. Have you ever heard of MOS score? Yeah. It'll actually translate the, the, the results of latency loss and jitter into a MOS score. So kind of gives you an idea of tying in why Avaya cares a credible a lot about networking. Right? Especially since we're, why we're running a lot of these devices on these tablets and phones now. We care about how people are connecting to the network because the performance, at the end of the day, they see a logo that says Avaya. We want to make sure their perception of who Avaya is always going to be the best. All right. Um, getting from there, there's one other service that most people don't realize goes on in Olympic. This, this actually acts like a, like a service provider as well. So there's a transparent LAN service going on. So 
Um, certain vendors come in and they actually set these, these booths and they're able to sell things. Like I believe Nike's one of the ones where they'll sell sneakers and things like that. And we got to provide them a transparent connection as if we were a Metro E provider as well. And that's what this transparent LAN thing, the purple switches you'll see in there providing. So at any point we're actually providing an <coughs> Ethernet links, E-Line and E-LAN on the same infrastructure between any venue to any vendor or even out to the internet. Right? All of these things are all locked down. And they configure it is one line command in each place. It's really, really cool. All right. All right. So from here, what we're going to do is we're going to move on to video surveillance as an example of IP multicast. All right. <coughs> now, Darren's going to go into a pretty cool demo, I think, um, where we're going to actually try and show you, explain to you why is it important for multicast. What it is in the, in the multicast world, I kind of explained it a second ago. It's where you have the worst case scenario. Every single camera is a source to a video feed, right? I think, is that the way you think multicast scales well? <laughs> right? So, why don't we go ahead and shift over to that? You ready, Darren? Yep. Thanks, guys. Earlier, it sounded like you said that it became multicast after it was transported back to the, no. the media center? <coughs> so, what happened was the camera feeds themselves, right? They're doing their own feed and their own protocol, right? Not IP? or? Uh, well, some of the cameras are IP. But not all the cameras are. <coughs> it's just debated on what some, kind of cameras are there. Some are unicast, though? Some are unicasting, of course, as well. So within the VRF, the VRF will handle unicast and multicast. Sure. It doesn't care. The point is it's got to be converted to be a video feed out to the broadcasters. <coughs> and okay. we just take that broadcasted feed, this, just as any other broadcaster, and feed it back down to all the other screens. So, so that, that building is where you'd normalize it for the set-top boxes and, yeah, and exactly. multicast it out for there, from there. Exactly. I see. Yeah, yeah. Just like any other IPTV environment would do. <coughs> There you go. Cool. Have fun. Thanks, sir. <laughs> Real quick, I, I mean, I'm just looking at this, and I don't want to get too far off <coughs> my question. I don't know where it's going to fall out of it. This is awesome. Cool. I'm glad you I like it. So many different levels. Ethan swore to me I'd be a believer when you were done talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, that said, this is standard, or relatively standard. I looked at the one of the sheets a minute ago, and Terrasis was playing in it, a company I won't speak of, because I don't like them, plays in it, <laughs> and nobody else plays in it. Why are, you got, why are you the only company who appears to be not acquired by somebody and who doesn't suck who's winning at this? So I joined Avaya about two and a half years ago. Uh, several people came to me while I was working my old company, deploying a lot of MPLS and working on SPB as we were looking at it for other <laughs> applications. Um, and I was kind of like Randy, like Avaya. I didn't even think Avaya had networking. And then I started <coughs> looking around. I was blown away by what they had. Probably the same reaction you're having right there because they took everything we were working on standards and they did it because they saw the value. Now, we've gone through, before joining Avaya, we've had many interop events. Now, let me give you an idea what the interop events were. So as we're going through the IEEE NTF, we try to do these interop events to make sure we're actually testing the things we're writing, not simply just creating <coughs> BS standards. Right? So in the interop events itself, we've, we've the live ones I can tell you who participated. So um, HP at Interop, we actually did an Interop as well. So while we were running a live network, we were also doing an Interop. We had HP plugged into it. Alcatel was plugged into it. We were running the backbone. There were several test vendors coming into it, right? Um, I can't say the other vendors I know who are working on it. You mentioned one, right? I will tell you that when I'm working <coughs> in the standards, most major vendors are actually next to me. Yeah. Okay? Every you guys are just ahead of the curve. We're way ahead of the curve. That's why I joined here. I was blown away by the functionality. The idea of thinking differently about networking <coughs> has been so overdue for so long. Mm -hmm. right? yep. That's why it's a lot of fun to do this. All right, thanks. Yep.